Hi, and welcome to the Haverhill Journal, where we take a look at what's happening now in our city. I'm Lindsay Paris, and in the spirit of the kids across Haverhill that have gone back to school this week, we're getting educated about the brand new and fabulous Museum of Printing opening up in town, and learning from the enthusiastic instructors and students of the College of Older Learners, or COOL, at NECC, both of which we'll be visiting later. But first, rivers and lakes are drying up across the Merrimack Valley as historic drought conditions continue, and it's having a major impact on everything from home water usage to local farm production. Come along with us as we tour some of the most hard-hit areas. An extreme drought was declared in Essex County in mid-August, and it's only getting worse every day. Right here in the middle of Crystal Lake, where's all the water gone? We can show you. So I'm walking up here along the edge of Canosa Lake and our cameraman is standing on the bottom of Canosa Lake at least 15 feet below me, probably more. Now sometimes, as I'm sure you've seen, the water comes all the way up over these rocks and even crosses into the road. So you can see if you're more than 15 feet down, that's a pretty big drought. Now over here is where the pipe feeding into Canosa Lake from Crystal Lake is. And as you can see, there's a lot of water coming out of that. And when we were over at Crystal Lake, you could see it was practically dry. So all of that water from Crystal Lake has come over here, helping fill up Canosa Lake, but still, as you can see, very, very low. We monitor the lake levels constantly. We monitor weather forecasts, long range forecasts. For example, right now we're in a drought watch, which means we've asked people to implement voluntary conservation measures to try to reduce water usage. Our main reservoir is Canosa Lake. The water treatment plant is at Canosa Lake. We also have Millvale Reservoir, which we pump water from to Canosa Lake. And we have Crystal Lake on the west side of Haverhill, and we pump water from Crystal to Canosa Lake. So everything ends up at Canosa Lake for treatment. We had a three-year period back in 99 to 2002. Uh, where the lake level actually reached its lowest point on record. Right now we're a little below 109 feet. Back then I think we were down to about 102 to 103 feet. We're actually trending pretty close to that period of time back then right now. So we, we are very concerned. These are the driest conditions many residents can remember. When was the last time you saw this many exposed boulders here at Bradley Brook State Park in the Merrimack River? And it's not even low tide either. For a couple of years now, we've been looking at bringing on additional water supply for the city, um, which would be some type of groundwater well along the Merrimack River. If the drought continues for a long period of time through next year, we're looking at the possibility of uh, actually expediting that project to get additional water online. I've probably never seen in my lifetime of uh, better than 60 years uh, a drought that's been this severe and this deep. Um, a good portion of this, the state is in a pretty severe drought. With our farm, we're lucky in that we've got some drip irrigation systems to help with some of the crops, and, um, and so we're in relatively good shape. This weather, certainly there's been an abundance of sunshine this, this summer, and so things like uh, berries and fruit and melons, which we have in our CSA, watermelon in our CSA, are very, very sweet because the more, the more sunshine, the more sugars are produced, so, so the quality has been superb. The apples taste really, really good. We're all well supplied. Call your local farm to see what their ability is and what they have, and I think you'll be quite surprised at what we all have to offer. Well, there's not much we can do about the lack of rainfall. There are many things you can do to conserve water, like not watering your lawn between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., mulching your flowers and garden beds to prevent evaporation, or not washing your car outside, taking it to the car wash because they recycle their water. And you could even get a rain barrel, like I did. But as you can see, it didn't help very much. If you go on the National Weather Service, mm -hmm. they actually have a, a, a drought website and they actually monitor drought conditions and drought forecasts and right now the forecast is for the drought to continue particularly for our area so i think a lot of people are really really thinking about this and doing it which is good experts say this drought will likely get worse in the short term as september traditionally is one of the driest months of the year and no heavy gales are forecast but a few showers that are expected in the short term may provide a little relief an incomparable collection of rare antique machines and special graphic art and print collections has relocated to Haverhill and is opening its doors next week. 
the Museum of Printing, one of only three such museums in the U.S., has moved to its new Thornton Avenue home from its longtime North Andover location. And starting September 10th, the public is invited to visit this large and beautiful addition to Haverhill's cultural footprint. Museum executives Frank Romano and Kim Picard gave us a sneak peek. Hi, I'm Frank Romano with the Museum of Printing, now in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Just moved here from North Andover. We moved 52 tons of printing presses and artifacts. And I'm here with Kim Pickard, who was one of the founders of the museum. We started when the Boston Globe started to uh, move transition from hot type to cold type, and they were getting rid of their linotype machines. And some of the printers and the typesetters there thought, this all, it's all going away, it'll never be the same, we should start collecting some of this. I was assigned to do a uh, story on it, on the group, for the uh, New England Printer and Publisher. And I thought, hey, this is kind of cool, so I just got more and more involved. In 1999, we found a home in North Andover. The building in North Andover was very limited in what we did. Here, we're on one floor, and we really have the ability to handle almost anything. People come from all over the world to research the artwork we have on linotype fonts or to look at some of the equipment or much of the ephemera that we have and also to look at some of the specimen books uh, which were the way companies promoted their type over 200 years or so. Almost everybody watching this has probably used Times Roman or Helvetica at some point in their life. We have the original drawings for those typefaces. The linotype machine was invented in 1886 and it was the primary way that we set type in the world for over 80 years. And then photographic typesetting came in and then desktop publishing and today it's all digital. This is the last line of type that was ever manufactured. This is 1972. The Dow Jones gave it to us and they had acquired it um, just before the end. This is an example of an old print shop, very typical of what happened in America. So they would be doing bill heads, business cards, stationery. This is a cabinet with type drawers in it, and each drawer would have one typeface in one point size. And then you would assemble these one at a time in a composing stick to make up your lines and then your pages. A daily newspaper took six people to produce one page. One of the most interesting things we have, by the way, is the cylinder that printed the front page of the New York Times when man walked on the moon. Every day they had to set the entire page in metal make a mold, curve the mold, then cast those cylinders, and they printed it on six printing presses. And here is the most unique collection of typewriters that you're going to find. We have more, but this is a good representative sample of all of them. We have about 100 typewriters in the collection, and they probably the oldest one here probably goes back to the 1890s. This is the only collection of photographic typesetting machines in the world, from the very first one in 1949. New England, by the way, was a major center for manufacturing these devices. Companies like Photon and CompuGraphic began in New England. Many people come here because they had done paste up over the years with rubber cement and wax. The CompuGraphic CompuWriter was introduced in 1971 and it combined the keyboard and the phototype sitting machine into one device and it sold for under $7,000. And it opened up the market for photo typesetting unbelievably. Small newspapers, small magazines, small book setters um, all use this. And we've even saved all of the printed circuit boards that were inside it. So you could see the, the technology of the day. Did it come with the ice cream? No, every operator would decorate the machines with their own stuff. This was one of the first color scanners, 1960s, cost a million dollars. At the time, in order to print color, you had to separate your image into four areas, yellow, magenta, cyan, and black. And this is the machine that did it. And it opened up printing color in magazines and newspapers and books. So there we have the collection of computers. So you have the four original Macintoshes from number one on. We even have a Next machine. I worked with Steve Jobs on the font library for the Macintosh. And so he sent me a new Macintosh whenever one came out. So that was the first one, that was the second one, third and fourth over there. And then when he left and formed Next, he sent me a Next machine. I would send him a fax every now and then, say, Steve, where's the software? Because no one was writing software for it. Uh, there's an Apple here, uh, there's a Radio Shack. Uh, just to show people the kinds of the beginnings of the personal computer world. This is our library. There are 6,000 volumes here. We have groups of every age group you can possibly imagine. Uh, from Cub Scouts 
to Boy and Girl Scouts, grade schoolers, high schoolers, college students of various kinds, uh, master's students, uh, red hat ladies. So the Museum of Printing attempts to involve people at every age in terms of the history of print. It's a real wow factor going on here that people have. He, uh, it might be from the typewriter collection, it, it could be just from some of the ephemera. It's things that they never knew about that have impacted their lives. Join us uh, starting September 10th. We're going to be open for a week, free admission from 10 until 3 every day. And you can find out more about us at www.museumofprinting.org where you'll find everything you want to know about the museum. It is really unbelievable what they have to see there, so much more than what I could include in that piece. And I would definitely encourage all of you to stop in. Visit the museum from September 10th to September 17th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. for their grand opening event and every Saturday in the following weeks. You can find more information online at museumofprinting.org. Back to school time is here, and not only for young kids, senior citizens are also heading back to class as part of the College of Older Learners, or COOL, program at Northern Essex Community College. With subjects ranging from Cuba-U.S. relations to memoir writing to Tai Chi, there's something to match everyone's interest, as we found at their recent seminar showcase. You learn so much. Everything is just so exciting. It's a wonderful organization. About eight years ago, mm -hmm. um, I went on sabbatical and I chose for sabbatical um, to research lifelong learning projects and research them across New England mm -hmm. and came back to here with a presentation and the college accepted it and that's when we started running it. Any good college has a lifelong learning component. Every one of them is called something else, um, but they offer classes for people 50 on up. You don't have to be old <laughs> to take a class. I have been with Cool for about five years, almost from the beginning, and I've enjoyed everything that I have taken. Well, I think uh, the one that I took uh, that I think most about is the course that dealt with how to get ready to retire and uh, what is uh, retirement life like and how should you prepare yourself for retirement. Whenever it's time for a new course, I kind of feel like a kid in a candy shop saying, what can I do now? People don't have to be college professors to give these classes. Um, they are member-led and it is a member-driven organization, but now we also have what I refer to as Cool Plus, and that's having college professors giving some of these classes, so it's really enhanced this whole program. I am so excited to teach a class as part of the Cool program. Um, I had known about Cool for a few years, but never had an opportunity to, to participate because I'm in my 20s. Um, so I approached Nancy, and I'm like, can I teach a class? And she's like, Sure you can. So I'm running um, Intro to Television Production. So we're going to do a show from writing it and, and creating it and developing it. And then we're going to have um, everybody learn how to use the cameras and learn how to direct and learn how to read on camera and do all of that stuff. And then we're going to put a show together and we're going to put it out there and it's going to be a blast. It gives us a chance to meet people, uh, people that we wouldn't ordinarily meet and uh, it keeps me going. The participants should be involved mm -hmm. in the process, so they should bring to the class an aspect to it that the teacher doesn't have to lead. So that's kind of an ideal cool class. It's where you, you're, you're part of the experience, not just sitting there absorbing. The college has been wonderful, and I think that's one of the things we should keep in mind, is that uh, a college like this in Haverhill is a wonderful resource. It's a wonderful opportunity for people to stay engaged, um, use their frontal cortex for something other than just sitting inside your head, and um, using that most important vital organ in your body, your brain. If you want to sign up or even teach a course for COOL, call 978-556-3110 or visit necc.mass.edu backslash community engagement backslash COOL. The Haverhill Cultural Council's grant application season has begun, and they're changing up the way grants are awarded to attract more applicants to the program. Anyone working on a capital project, 
program, or field trip that falls under the blanket of arts, humanities, or interpretive sciences is welcome to apply for a grant as small as $100 or as large as $3,000. While event support was generally stopped after three years in the past, the HCC is now considering funding beyond three years for programs that have substantially benefited the community. Applications are now being taken online only at mass-culture.org backslash Haverhill through October 17th. If you have a story or event you'd like to see featured on the Haverhill Journal, call us at 978-372-8070 or email info at haverhillcommunitytv.org. And don't forget to like us on Facebook or at our HC Media YouTube channel. And that's what's happening in Haverhill the week of September 1st. I'm Lindsay Paris, and we'll see you next time.